afternoon, or depending upon when you're watching this, maybe it's good morning or good evening. My name is Ann Smith, and I'm here to introduce a friend of mine uh, whom I've worked with for now for over nine years. Uh, together we manage two nonprofits in the um, main area, but actually we're global because our nonprofits are to benefit African refugees in New England and across the world. Uh, my friend today is Anthony Bazia, and he and I co-founded two nonprofits, as I said, um, Project Bazia and Africans United. Um, I'm going to briefly speak about, very briefly, about Africans United. Primarily, Africans United started because we were concerned about literacy in um, across the world with refugees who were learning English and finding the books were not interesting. So we've written um, about uh, eight books now we have published through Amazon, um, which help refugees read and learn English at different levels. These books are also used in rural schools in Africa, where finding materials that are good for kids to learn English over there um, can be very difficult. Uh, they don't really know too much about the world that we live in, so they want to read books about the people they know and the villages they know, and that's what we've done. We've created books for that purpose. Um, the second nonprofit is uh, based uh, more locally, and uh, I would say it's definitely Mr. Bazia's brainchild. So, Bazia, why don't you tell everybody about Africans United of New England? Uh, African United is about to bring all African in the level of the sixth state in New England together, but it's in the goal, because a lot of time people think uh, bring people together just because they are the same people. But you have to be a purpose. And one of the things we're concerned about the education in the United States and the small business, and how to understand the system of the United States, and part of it, how to get the citizen in the United States to be willing in the process to be an American citizen. Okay, so you reach out to people uh, right now. I believe you told me you're contacting many of the community organizations like the, uh, the Burundians and the Rwandans and the Somalis who are here locally uh, so that they can share uh, accomplishments they've had as refugees and perhaps talk about common problems. That's correct. African United is going to be the bridge between the African different community in, in New England and then the government of the United States, it can be the level of the state, how to make sure they can understand the system. So that's why we reach out to all different communities, Somalia, South Sudanese, and North, Burundi, and Rwanda, uh, Zaire, uh, Angola, uh, some Chad, and even when I'm talking about something very interesting, anybody who have a small number of different, of the continent of Africa, if you don't have enough number, feel good to be under African United. We love you guys to be under us because you can see a lot. Because to be a community alone, I think it's all about number. You recently, when I was uh, in an office, I met a, uh, a woman who's been here for seven years. And as far as she knows, she and her family are the only people from Sierra Leone that live in the greater Portland area. So I immediately told them about this organization because it's really important to connect with other people that have similar problems. Um, and Anthony Bazia is well qualified to work with these people. He arrived in the United States in 1990 and came back, went back and forth between his homeland of, of what became South Sudan and the United States many times. Um, but he is also the son of a chief, and that uh, tribal chief in South Sudan, which meant that he grew up in a home where serving other people was the primary goal. Uh, the dinner table conversation in Bazia's house growing up was always about what are we doing to help the people of our tribe, our village, our area, how do you solve problems? And uh, that's what he still does, uh, especially here, because when he first came, he was working with the Lost Boys down in Philadelphia. Um, 
We could end up talking about what Mr. Bazir did down in Philadelphia and in different parts of the United States with the refugees from South Sudan for probably uh, an hour or more. But what we are here for today is 2021 is a very special year. So at this point, I'm going to ask you to uh, share with everybody why we're having this conversation. Uh, the very important thing South Sudan became a country since 2011, and uh, we're coming up to the 10 year from South Sudan became a nation. But I believe there was a lot of issue. I don't want to go behind that uh, right here. I'm here to tell the South Sudanese Pacific. I know there are uh, four, uh, 64 tribes. We need to stop talking about the, uh, the tribe. We need to talk about we as South Sudanese, what we can do for ourselves to make the country better. It's enough since 1995, since 1955, since 1940 something, all fighting. You can't be living the life your grandpa was fighting, your mom was fighting, your generation and generation. The only true peace in to make people to unite in a common goal. Everybody fight for the South Sudan at a different level. If you're under Rispele, if you're under education, under different country, the goal all about to get dependent. You guys already have the dependent now, like 10 years, but you guys never enjoying this dependent. Why the reason is because you watching the time, hit each other, killing each other, but the nation never ever gonna be in the name of the tribe until you guys became national of South Sudanese child. And, and this problem, the problem of South Sudan on the 10th anniversary of its becoming an independent nation, is not just the problem of South Sudan. Many countries in Africa have had these tribal conflicts. Some are still having them. Some are learning to cope with them. So our for, uh, this particular conversation today is intended to give everybody who's listening um, or watching, whichever, um, an understanding of how South Sudan became a country independent from the original country, Sudan. And, and from what I know, in, in writing some of the books we've written about, about South Sudan, uh, South Sudan, the country, uh, Sudan, the country, was the biggest country in Africa and very powerful. But starting in, at least officially, in 1955 with a war called Anyanya I, um, the desire for the country to be divided, the, the contrast between the North and the South, um, became more and more obvious with more and more conflicts over the years. Uh, and so my first question to you, Mr. Bazia, is how different is the North from the South of this rather huge country? The one thing I will give a credit for the North, the most civilized, modern South Sudanese ahead of the game. And this is the reality since I grew up in North, and I have to commit it, these people that are more mobilized. The only difference in Sudan, and, and, and this is gonna be not only in the level of Sudan, there's a three group who are affected by all this issue. I would mention Darfurian people and Nubian people okay. and South Sudanese. The way Arab create the problem between us, they never talk about us like we're black people, but they use name. And this is the problem in the first place, even more than the issue of South Sudan. So, so let, me, let me interrupt you a minute here, and, and, and I'm trying to think of this huge country, which is about twice, originally was at least twice the size of Texas, okay, because I know South Sudan is the size of Texas, and they're about equal, the territories, all right? So you have an area in the South that is predominantly black African people, many different tribes, but you are all black Africans. And then if you go up to both the east and the west side, 
of the upper part, you have the Darfurians in the west, and you have in the east, you have the Nubians living in the mountains. And they are also black African people. But then you have a group of people in the capital, in the middle, in the north, and spread out from there of Arabs who are also, in terms of their culture and religion, Muslims. Um, and, and you say they were more uh, civilized. They had more experience with government That's because correct. they came from Egypt and from the north. Um, and so for many, many years, they controlled both of these groups that were all around you. How did they treat, you said they called them by a name. Um, I'm not concerned with that, but how did the Khartoum government treat the black Africans who were all around them? How did they treat them differently from their own yeah, people? When, when I say name, because the, the Khartoum government never used you guys all the black people who are supposed to see what we can do for you guys. If I just say, example, the Darfurian, they, they are Muslim. If I look at the Nubian, there is a Christian and there is a Muslim. If I look at South Sudan, they're all Christian. So, I have a few pagans. Yeah. So those ideas came from the North, who are Arab, to make these three groups to be divided by different issues and that they can fight. So but they kept I'm, you separated. Right. But I'm saying, if in, if in my choice, if we were looking in the beginning, before even South Sudan became a nation, we are black people in Sudan who need to create a system to solve the issue. But now it's late. But today, because I cannot talk about that much, today I'm talking about South Sudan Pacific. They have uh, 64 tribes, and since they, they got dependent, I don't feel like they enjoy the dependent. Okay, and, 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 and the difference, again, my question is, they controlled, they, the people of Khartoum, who were primarily Arabs and, as I said, dominantly Muslims, they controlled this whole huge country. How did they treat, without saying it, how did they treat the areas that were, that were the black people lived as different from their own area? Yeah, the reason they was living there, they feel like the second citizen in Sudan. Uh, does include a Nubian, include Darfurian, include South Sudanese. But to look at it in the big picture, there was a game behind it. But even the true group, they never understand it. Even no South Sudanese, even not North of uh, Nuba of Darfurian. But they, because they weren't, they weren't as. I think the word is sophisticated. That's correct. They didn't know enough about how the world operated. These were people, many tribes of which were living as they had. And, 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 and my audience isn't going to believe me, it, not for hundreds of years. They had been living the way their, a thousand years ago, their tribe had been living, the same way, raising cows, moving from place to place, not having any education, not knowing anything other than the, uh, the unit of the tribe for government. So they didn't know they were being taken advantage of. And, and I would like you to speak at this point. What was the North getting out of this by keeping all these people ignorant of, of their rights as people? Uh, at the same time, they give them a little of attention that are part of the system, like job and all that. But they don't have the full citizen. I can give you an example when the North's running the business. If I say the North people have a store of a supermarket, when the South Sudanese came, or when a person came from Darfur or from the Nubian, the price is different. Oh. But the North who are running the game, they got different price. But we never know about that until a lot of issues happen. And this is one of the things I keep saying. The game of the people who mobilized or civilized of the North, they was ahead of the game. 
But oh, my yeah. concern, I wish if the black people in the general, that includes South Sudanese, include the Nubian, include the, the Darfur, if we were just talking about let united only we are black, it doesn't matter if you're Muslim, you're Christian, and I think we are issued the same. But we never have a chance to come to that idea. That's right. And right now, for me, I'm not willing to get to back that, but right now it's too late because since South Sudan left the North, if I right or wrong, South Sudanese, they need the North, and North needs South Sudanese. That's right now is a different game. But South Sudanese even know when they left North Sudan, the North say South Sudanese, they cannot run them own life by themselves. Right. That's telling me the North was the right. And, and, and that, and, and I think one of the reasons they feel very comfortable saying that is that continuously, since in the last 10 years, there have been conflicts over and over and over again. And, and I guess the other thing I'm, I'm fishing for here is what was the North getting besides the power? The, I mean, there's enormous resources in South Sudan. Why don't you, you know, mention some of those to the Okay, audience. there's a two research in, 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 in the north and the different in south. South Sudanese have diamond, have uh, uh, uranium, have even oil. So they have to keep that in the control. I can tell you a story when Shofron is one of the company of United States that was there. When Anyanya II, that Which under the second, second, second movement, revolution, revolution so under yeah. uh, John Garang, they killed some American in, in a chauffeur company who came from United States, how to dig the oil out. So United States, because they have value for the woman race, they give up the contract, they left Sudan. And left because they cannot afford to let American die in the soil of the North Sudan. So that for me, show me something, nobody even in that time look at it in the value. But American, this is what the woman race in American have value. So when I'm going to go back to, to my people, right now it's hard for me to repeat what is past. I'm just going to tell anybody who watching this interview, ask yourself if your grandpa born in the issue and you born in the issue, do you think it's fair to be killing each other all the time until we finish? I don't think so. I'm gonna give you two country examples. We have Burundian used to fight among themselves. That's Hutus and Tutus. After all this killing, what happened? Burundian today, our Rwandian today, have a nice country and they give up. Even right now in Rwanda, if you ask somebody about him tribe, you can get arrested because the land was a hard way. So I want my South Sudanese people to give up hatred among themselves. If your cousin die, your mom, your sister, nobody's gonna bring him back in the way you're thinking. It's only if we wanna remind those people who die in the name of South Sudan, let's do the right thing for ourselves. Your as we think about the CPA, 10 years after the CPA, the Comprehensive Peace Agreement, which was basically started by Tony Blair and uh, the second President Bush, correct? The That's two correct. of them got together and decided that this was ridiculous. This country just kept trying to uh, emerge as a nation, the southern part of, of South, the southern part of Sudan, the South Sudanese, but it would just kept going on and on, and the incidents with Chevron, I think you're right, that's what brought it to their attention as much as anything else. Here was a world resource going to waste in the middle of a war, and they pushed the North to discuss an agreement, and then there was a vote. All the people of South Sudan were asked to vote at a certain time after several years of preparation, right, with the CPA. They were asked to vote. Did they want to be part of the North or did they want to be a separate country? And the vote was 
tell us. 89, 99. No, no, the other way went down. Yeah. 99 percent. 99 percent. Wanted to separate. To separate. And uh, one other thing, I will have a chance to mention this book here. This will talk about it. It was about Tony Blair and Young Bush who bring the peace of South Sudan. I want to repeat this. I know there's people until today they claim South Sudan came with a gun. The truth is about the international community agree, and it's special. I'm going to mention something very important because South Sudan is one of the people fighting in the long time was Arab, and that the only people say Arab was not helping them the way they wanted. Until 9-11 happened in the United States, and, and, and American and British accept what South Sudan fights for. So I'm repeat myself to anybody, he, he claimed South Sudan just came by gun. I know they fight to bring the right, but in the end of the day, Bush and Tony Blair, in the last minute, there was a part of the people to make this agreement of CPA, and then the South Sudanese people vote to be a nation. So that's for me, it's like 100, I can just say 100. There is no any country in the world vote for that number. You're right. Let right. be honest. Yeah. And these, these people were not just the people who were still left in South Sudan. This was well over a million people worldwide who had fled from the wars, who didn't want to be there anymore. But they were contacted. They were said, come and vote on this day and decide. And they decided they wanted to be a separate country. And, and you told me that you were there when the votes were counted. You were in South Sudan. Uh, tell tell uh, our audience, what was the crowd like? You the said crowd, they were crazy. Yeah, the crowd was happiness. It's like somebody have a heavy thing in his head, and he released it down when South Sudan voting to have South Sudan dependent. But today, we're in 10 years. And this 10 year, if I say, if I'm right or wrong, maybe the, the people who are watching this program, they can correct me. Maybe since we have South Sudan a country, maybe we'll celebrate maybe twice only. Yeah, I know. Maybe. That means eight years we we'll never celebrate July 9. So make me, my heart is broke. Make me useless in the way I look at it, because I'm part of it. Even I know I'm an American citizen, but before I became American citizen, I can call myself I was Sudan. Was this South Sudan divide became South Sudan, but it still it's bothered me. Of course. So this message we hear was honest made. I want you guys to know we are not just here to talk about what is happening. We're here to talk about forgiveness and let the nation come together. If we want our South Sudan to go, there's nobody above the law. Let's create the system who you can be fair for all of us, like America, like Canada. How can, if we have, just in the United States, 100 South Sudanese, and I would debate any South Sudanese who live in America. I don't want to talk about Canada. You mean 100,000? 100, 100,000. You live in America, you play by the book. But why you cannot play by the book in South Sudan? And if, if America was doing bad for us, I don't think we're going to be here. Thank you. It's OK. Um, I think what we want to continue in this conversation, and, and we, have, we have a lot of things we'd like to develop as independent topics. Um, and I want to list a few of them here, because Bazia and I have been talking about this. We actually had planned with the, um, to have a celebration on July 11th, because the 9th was a weekday. We found a place, and we were going to have a celebration. But we did one of those, what was it, two years ago, before That's COVID? Correct, yeah. And nobody came. Nobody came. It was just to celebrate the accomplishments of the newest nation on our planet. Um, and so we decided instead to make this TV program. Uh, hopefully to see if maybe a year from now, after talking about um, what's going on in the South Sudanese community and what pre might be preventing South Sudanese from celebrating the CPA and its independence, that there might be a real physical celebration someplace. Um, 
Uh, I have my own theories. Uh, one of them is that uh, when we wrote this book, we compared South Sudan to the United States. Um, as a, in other words, a country that had had a revolution and got its independence from a stronger power. But you know, I went back and I did some research not too long ago, and I discovered that the first 10 years of the United States independence were not a piece of cake. There were a lot of problems. And there are reasons why the South Sudanese struggle with building a strong, stable government. Many of the problems they have have nothing to do with the people themselves, but just circumstances. So we would like to return and have a, another interview fairly soon in which we talk about basically Tribalism, which you've also introduced as always also introduced as a problem. Um, one big thing that separates two groups of people in South Sudan is the farmers from the nomads and how the, could they solve the problem of people who don't have any fixed location for a good part of the year. And then the third thing is uh, talk about the leadership and the dream of the man who made the CPA possible, John Garang. Now, we haven't gotten to that today, but John Garang unfortunately died even before the vote. That's correct. And I think um, it behooves us to acquaint our audience, whether it's you're an American or whether you're South Sudanese or whether you're from another part of Africa or another part of the world. We want the world to know what happened to John Garang and why his death had such a strong effect on the future of South Sudan. Um, imagine for a minute, and this is just a proposal for our topic for another show. Imagine for a minute what would have happened in the United States if George Washington had not been able to be the first president. What if the ball was just thrown into the court and the power struggle began immediately, instead of having the man who had been at the helm for the entire Revolutionary War, who was obviously a very steady, stable individual? Uh, thank you for listening to what we have to say. Um, I hope we haven't been too uh, confusing, but uh, you can contact us. Uh, all you have to do is go to the Project Bazia website, and we will be more than happy to respond to any questions you have if you email us or call either of us on the phone. Thank you. Many, many. Heroes, heroes, I love.